All right, welcome everyone. Seeing we got some people starting to roll in. See Becky Vanest, welcome. Carl Rebstock, welcome. Great, great, great to see you. John Hunt, Peter Darley, Kenisa Tejada, welcome. It's so good to see you all. We're excited to get going here today. Uh, we started a minute early, probably gonna start officially a minute late, uh, just to let people start rolling in. We had over 100 people sign up for this uh, virtual experience today, so we're, we're really excited to get going just as much as you are to, to be here. Um, but so just for the sake of letting as many people as possible roll in, uh, we are going to just wait a little bit longer. So I hope you're all having a great Wednesday. Uh, it's, I guess, officially converting from fall to spring or fall, fall to uh, fall to winter and not spring quite yet. I wish it was. Um, but uh, you know, life, life is good here, and I'm excited to be part of this event today. Leading this from, from Darley Smart Firefighting perspective. Uh, great to see you, Jason Legare, Jeff Ring. Thanks for being here. Lou Vaselli, Sonny Kirkley, awesome to see you here. Tim Shashko, welcome. So we'll just give it another 30 seconds or so before we officially get going. Alex Peterson, thanks. I uh, will we'll say this throughout the day, but we really encourage you to ask questions. We've got some really high caliber uh, thought leaders here that have, have been around and, and, and have a, a lot of insight to the industry. Um, and so use this as a chance, be selfish and ask questions. That's, that's the point here. We want you to, to get some value out of this. Um, so it's, it's officially uh, one past the hour. Um, so for the sake of starting the show, we will start it. So everyone, uh, welcome to this virtual event on enhancing situational awareness with FirstNet and drone technology. We're really excited to have you here today. And I'm sure like many of you, you hear these buzzwords, artificial intelligence, big data, LTE, drones, FirstNet. It's all cool and great, but what, what, what does it all actually mean? Um, especially today, we're gonna dive into what is FirstNet? Um, what does it actually allow first responders to do that they couldn't do before? Uh, today, we are specifically gonna explore how FirstNet network enables drone technology for public safety. Uh, we've got experts around the company, around the country. They're going to explore what does a common operating picture actually mean in 2021 and 2022 and five, 10 years moving forward. And how can the use of drones expand coverage and enable first responders to be better, faster, safer, smarter? Um, so what we're going to get into the outline for today is I'm going to give a quick intro and everyone's going to do a quick sort of 60 second intros here. Then we're going to go into a high-level overview from uh, the CTO of FirstNet, Jeff Bracture. Then we're going to have a live demo from Mark and his team at York County and with, with DroneSense. Then we're going to have a conversation uh, kind of from looking at what the FirstNet roadmap is, as well as what, uh, what the role is from PSCR. And then lastly, kind of an open moderated panel uh, by uh, Kirk McKenzie here um, and myself with everyone here to talk about some of the nuances here uh, with all things technology, FirstNet, and LTE and drones. Um, so for everyone who doesn't know me, my name is Kevin Sofin, uh, one of the co-founders of SmartFireFighting.com and a uh, full-time business development manager at WS Darling Company. Uh, really excited to be here today and coordinating this event. Um, so we're going to go around the horn under 60 second quick intro so you guys know who we are. I will now turn it over to Kirk and then we'll go Mark and Therese from there in that order. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thanks for having me and uh, to many of my friends and mentors on the call here. Uh, I'm a 30 year firefighter veteran, uh, retired last March and now teach under our undergraduate next gen technology at the University of Cincinnati. I'm also uh, the president of McKinsey Smart Technologies where I work with a number of startup and enterprise teams on moving the industry from a two way voice command and control into what will be enabled with FirstNet LTE broadband and uh, all the great things that come to that to save some of the more than 7,000 lives lost each day in America. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kirk. Mark? Hello, everyone, and thank you, Kevin. Um, my name is Mark Brunell, and I am with the York County, Maine, Emergency Management Agency, and I am the team leader of our volunteer UAS team. Our UAS team was formed in 2016, so we've been around, we've learned a lot along the way, and I'm also a Part 107 certificate holder and a fixed wing pilot for 30 years. Thanks, Mark. Therese? Hi, everyone. My name is Therese Manley. 
and I work at NIST, uh, the National Institute for Standards and Technologies, and specifically in the area of public safety and working with communications or wireless communication uh, for first responders. Uh, with 20 plus years of wireless engineering, I help support from a communication standpoint uh, the, some of the research that happens at NIST and PSCR. However, we also are uh, looking at ways to use deployables or drones as a, as a method for um, uh, allowing those wireless communications to reach further and help more first responders. So I'll talk a little bit about that later. Thanks, Therese. We'll go Travis, Mike, and Josh in that order next. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. And hi, everybody. Travis Hull with the First Responder Network Authority. I've uh, been here about three years now, just over that. Um, prior to the First Net Authority, I was a contractor in many different spaces with unmanned systems, working as a project engineering manager on uh, MQ-9 aircraft. So many hours uh, with working with the teams there and some of the big birds. Um, also worth noting, I spend my time as a volunteer with a, as a canine handler with a search and rescue team. I've been doing that just about 10 years now, so I also get out in the field with the, uh, the search teams uh, real time uh, out here in the Pacific Northwest of the Kitsap Peninsula where I live. So thanks again all. Look forward to talking more about uh, the First Net Authority Roadmap and everything we've got going on in the drone space. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Travis. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Mike Massarino. I'm a director of sales over here at DroneSense. Uh, we couldn't be more excited to be participating on this webinar with, with everybody involved. Uh, my background, about 11 years in, in public safety UAS utilization. Uh, I used to work for WS Darley Company, uh, a lot on the hardware end, helped a lot of agencies develop drone programs from the ground up. Uh, and now the amount of reach and, um, you know, things that we're able to accomplish here at DroneSense, we're really pumped to give you a little tidbit uh, of that today. Um, so with that, Josh, if you can introduce. Yeah, thank, thanks, Mike. Uh, Kevin, thank you for having us. My name is Joshua Pruitt. I am the Senior Tech Solutions Engineer here at DroneSense. I'm responsible for all training. Uh, and field operations of the number one public safety platform for drone utilization uh, in the country. Very, very excited to showcase the platform uh, along with our partners, Mark, Smart Firefighting, Darley. Uh, yeah, just really excited to show you guys what we have. Good deal. All right, well, Kyle, and then I'll have you introduce uh, Jeff after that. Yep, yeah, thanks, Kevin, for, for hosting us today and for uh, bringing everybody together for this conversation. Looking forward to it, especially looking forward to the demo. Uh, my name is Kyle Richardson. I serve as an advisor in the field for the First Net Authority. Travis is my colleague. Also, Jeff Bratcher is my colleague uh, who joins us as the chief technological officer uh, with First Net um, out of our uh, Boulder headquarters, our technical headquarters out of Boulder, Colorado. I'll pass it over to Jeff. He's going to provide an introduction for today's session, and um, we'll go from there. Jeff? Great. Thank you, Kyle. Good afternoon for those on the East Coast, and good morning for those joining us on the West Coast. Kevin, can you hear me okay? Audio is good? Yep, I can hear you great. Great. As Kyle mentioned, my name is Jeff Bratcher, and I'm the Chief Technology and Network Officer at the First Responder Network Authority, based here in Colorado in Boulder at our technical headquarters. I'm pleased to welcome you all to this webinar on using public safety broadband and unmanned aircraft systems technology to enhance situational awareness for public safety response. I'd like to thank Smart Firefighter smart firefighting for hosting this virtual event and also the york county emergency management nists public safety communications research division i'll put a plug there uh, i spent 10 years at the pscr program so glad to see therese on the call today as well uh, captain mckenzie darley drone sense and as well my colleagues travis and kyle who you heard from earlier before we get started i'd like to provide a brief update on the first net network and the growing FirstNet ecosystem, and as well touch on some of the unmanned aircraft systems used for public safety response. The FirstNet Authority is the organization responsible for ensuring the deployment, maintenance, and operation of the nationwide public safety broadband network, also known as FirstNet. This was created in law in February 2012 and passed by Congress as a direct outcome of a recommendation in the 9-11 Commission report that was published in 2004. In March of 2017, we awarded a 25-year contract to AT&T to build the FirstNet network nationwide in all 56 states and territories. The authority that I and Kyle and uh, we work at 
Travis is the government entity side for the public side of this public-private partnership. And we hold AT&T accountable for delivering this network and meeting network milestones and deliverables to ensure the development and involvement of the FirstNet network for public safety. We work hand in hand with public safety across the country to understand their critical communication needs. And I'm proud to say that it is, FirstNet is available in all 56 states and US territories today. As of last month, what you're seeing on the slide here, there are more than 18,500 public safety agencies and organizations using more than 2.8 million connections on the nationwide public safety broadband network. This is fantastic progress. We're all very pleased with this. It's only been about four and a half years since we awarded the contract and this level of adoption is outstanding. And we're very pleased that public safety is now using the network that was built with them and for them. We've established a growing ecosystem of devices, applications, and other tools as well for use on the network in support of public safety's life-saving critical communication mission needs. There are more than 315 FirstNet ready devices approved for use on the network. And these devices are built with access to band 14. That is the license spectrum to the FirstNet authority in the 700 megahertz spectrum band that was awarded to us on a nationwide basis as part of the legislation in 2012. We work closely with our partners at PSCR to publish the full list of devices that are approved for use on the FirstNet network. An exciting innovation in the devices space that we've done in the last few years is high powered user equipment. There's a unique aspect of the part 90 rules that governs our band 14 license that allows us to actually have higher power transmitters on the mobile devices. We have these vehicular modems that are now leveraging this aspect and uh, are referred to as the first net mega range solution. Touching on applications, we have over, a, over 180 unique applications now listed in the FirstNet app catalog. This is not a separate application store. It's merely a catalog of devices, I'm sorry, of applications that we found have been helpful for public safety's mission. But these apps in the catalog have gone through a higher bar of review and testing in concert with AT&T for security aspects. FirstNet's also driving potentially life-saving advances in this space, including the implementation of our Z-axis mapping technology. As we were leveraging public safety's input and in developing the request for proposals, a key feature public safety has been asking for is that 3D geolocation to track their public safety personnel. We now have that available on the FirstNet network and you can 3D track personnel and locate what floor a firefighter or police officer officer or emergency medical service member may be in a multi-level high-rise building. We also provide a unique service that has been a fantastic success story, the no cost access by the subscribers to the FirstNet dedicated deployable program. This includes mobile cell sites, satellite cell and light trucks, compact rapid deployables, or small portable cell sites that can be towed. We also have drones and flying cell on wings that I think will um, be beneficial as part of our discussion today. We've seen an increase in agencies seeking to pair their public safety broadband with their own unmanned aircraft systems as well. Public safety agencies are using these for search and rescue operations, crash reconstruction, hazmat scene deployment, assessing of storm damage and fire scenes, traffic control and more use cases. And that continues to grow. Connecting to mobile broadband adds an additional layer of near real-time situational awareness to these programs. And for example, equipped with night vision infrared capabilities, a connected drone can stream live footage back to base for search and rescue operations. These capabilities save agencies time, resources, and potentially lives. I'm excited to hear today's discussion on the lessons learned for incorporating public safety broadband into UAS programs. And at the FirstNet Authority, we're focused on evolving public safety's network, FirstNet, for the future. And we're encouraged by conversations like these, which help public safety consider what future broadband tools might be the most impactful for their operations and what we can do on the authority side to drive this into that nationwide network. So thank you all again for joining today. And I'm gonna hand it back to Kevin. Thank you, Jeff. We appreciate that. And uh, one thing that uh, 
I maybe didn't emphasize enough. We talked about it all in the promotion, but we're doing a live demo here today. Uh, so it's pretty cool. It's not just, hey, let's talk about the tech. Let's read some textbooks. Let's look at a white paper. It's nope. You're going to see technology live in action today. Um, so we want to, what, we're, what, what we'll be showing next is I'm going to bring Mark to, Mark, uh, let me make sure that uh, you can start your video here. Um, so we're going to have Mark Burnell come up and he's going to give a little oversight of what they're doing um, at your county. And then we're from there going to go into some of the live demo. So Mark, the, the floor is yours and um, so I'll go from there. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, it, as sort of the baseline for today, I'm going to demonstrate the kinds of missions that we've done with our UAS team. And these are practical missions. These are the things that you do in a small community. Uh, we represent the county of York, which is the southernmost county in the state of Maine. And we have 29 towns. We make ourselves available to the 29 towns. So I'm going to show a video and I will talk over the video. And um, it's going to give you an idea of really where we start and where we're starting with this technology and how important the common operating picture is. So if you just permit me to share my screen and find where we have to be. I am not seeing it. Not seeing it. So if you if you click that the green button uh, right there, share screen. It is it popping up with with some of the different screens that no. you. I'm not seeing my screen. I'm seeing. Um, let me see if this will. Okay. All right. We're going to do this. Oh, there we go. I see you. I'm now seeing your screen, which is showing the USB drive E at the top. Oh, okay, good. So everyone can see this. Yep. This this was just a simple um, exercise that we did for a local uh, a town who wanted to see where there were some encampments being built a few years ago near a river. Rather than send personnel into the area, they thought it might be better to do it this way. So we. We did some drone flying and uh, provided them the lat, lat longs and they got a good visual of what was in the area. So th this is the kind of support that we provide to our towns. And ideally uh, with the current system that we have, uh, people don't need to be with us to see this, nor do we need hey, to- Hey, Mark, I wasn't sure. Are, you, are we seeing the video yet? Because I'm still just seeing the screen. I'm not sure if you- uh, Yeah, the video should be playing. Uh, it's it's not playing. Uh, so maybe do you want to minimize that um, the screen up top there? That because uh, I see it's back. Yeah, Mark, we're seeing your folder, not the video itself. You're looking at the. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Where does stop sharing? I'm sorry. All good. Uh, we'll we'll figure this out quickly. Uh, yeah. So try and. Yeah, so if you, um, one more time, Mark, if you click the share screen at the bottom there, uh, you might have a few windows open. Um, you can choose the screen you're sharing. Okay, now I'm seeing. These uh, are not, yeah, it's not in the right place. Not in the right place. All right, everyone, we'll figure this out shortly. This is the beauty of all things tech, but we will figure this well out. i'm sorry about the, yeah no all, all good uh is it any of those it may be under the how about that uh yes i see a video yeah, i see it okay thank you very much thanks for stopping me yeah you're good so uh this was the encampment video that i was discussing so one of the one of the types of missions we can do, but it gives a common operating picture when we can transmit the information back to multiple points 
that are not in the area to be able to see and they can analyze it along uh, as, we, as we fly. I'm gonna scoot ahead. This is, uh, this is important because this is uh, training that we do with a special response team in the county. And uh, at this point, this is a training exercise, but they were approaching a, a potential hostage situation a scenario. And we operated with two drones. So one drone had the entire area under surveillance and the other drone was watching the personnel. So this allowed the commanders to be able to see all the, the entire picture from their command post and from other areas that were not on scene. So again, the type of joint training that we do is very important because we build relationships that way. Our drone program uh, uses seven drones, but in all fairness, about four of them are the ones that we are the go-to the go -to drones. This was a wildfire that <clears throat> we had in the, in the county. And I would draw your attention. I don't know if you get to see my cursor, but there's a tractor bulldozer pushing material here. We have an individual walking here and we were using a uh, flare that night in order to see where the fire was moving. That was very helpful to the first responders as the uh, fire was actually moving fairly quickly. Then we had some storm damage on the coast. We did some flying over an area called Camp Ellis. And you can see the types of damage you, that you get from a drone versus uh, walking up and down a street. You actually see roofs and you see debris in places where you otherwise wouldn't see it at ground level. The final video you're gonna see after this is uh, be of interest to all the firefighters because it was a very large mill fire that we had. And our support with the drone provided information that the fire incident commander was able to direct the streams of water in the right place and a very large building and obviously couldn't see up on top of the building, but with the drone, we were able to give them the information they wanted. That's gonna be coming up in just a second. Fortunately, we were able to climb above the spray and above the ladder trucks. And this fire burned uh, probably 12 hours, eight to 12 hours. And it was a very large fire. The uh, building has since been taken down, but hopefully this afternoon we'll be flying one of our drones uh, so that we can show video of what, what remains. But the common air operating picture is what's important here so that everyone can see exactly what's going on. So well, I will close that and stop share. And at this point, um, I'll pass it back to you, Kevin. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that context. And so now I'm gonna bring in Josh, who's gonna kind of talk us through what we what we just saw and learned from Mark and, and let, drive us through this live demonstration. So Josh, you're on mute there, Josh. Sorry about that. I'm gonna share my screen real quick and we'll, uh, we'll just jump in. Again, the focus of today's presentation, today's webinar is enhancing situational awareness. I'm gonna spend three minutes going through this slide deck and then we'll actually jump into the meat of the platform. And I'm gonna turn my, uh, my camera off here just so I can make sure that you guys are all uh, focusing on uh, on the video. So at DroneSense, we are the premier software for drones in public safety. And starting kind of with our mission statement, it's to provide a secure platform for current and future drone tech that's gonna empower operators to use the drones more effectively, improve situational awareness, and save more lives. 
Now, again, to me, this is kind of a very corporate mission statement. So I want to unpack this in a different way. Drones have become a great tool in public safety, but they are not without their complications. As public safety personnel, whether we're fire, EMS, law enforcement, emergency management, we already have a laundry list of certifications, qualifications, continuing education that we have to keep up with year over year just to be able to do our job. And now we've thrown drones into the mix. And again, they are a fairly complicated tool, but a great tool for what we do. And so it's my hope that agencies that have utilized or are starting to utilize drone sense, we can act as a bridge to essentially move you from the normal public safety personnel into a public safety aviator. And so with our platform, we essentially can take what the drone is seeing, passing it through our system up through our cloud on the AWS Gov cloud and down to our web console to any connected device anywhere in the world with sub-second latency. And so there's kind of a three-piece puzzle to our platform. We have a mobile application that is going to replace the manufacturer software for all of your command and control operations. So this is right now we're working specifically with DJI, with Parrot, and with Auto. Uh, but we hope to have additional manufacturers integrated in the future. This is the command and control piece. This is what your pilots are using in the field to go out and fly and hopefully provide that better situational awareness back to you. With the second piece of our platform being the web console and kind of the fleet management piece, which we won't get into today, but this is where all the data lives. So all of the telemetry is being tracked, all of your maintenance, all of your training hours, all of your equipment, all of that data that would be generated from a solid public safety fleet is tracked here to hopefully showcase that culture of safety being built up around your program. But the meat and potatoes of our platform and where we're going to focus the majority of our time today is going to be an operations hub. This is where all of the information, all of the live streaming, all of the telemetry is flowing into in real time, again, to any connected device anywhere in the world. But beyond seeing what the drone is seeing and seeing where the drone is, we provide a whole host of tools, including feature layers and some direct Esri integration to take that situational awareness to the next level. So what I'm gonna do is stop sharing this screen here and I am going to share a new screen if you'll just give me one moment here. And what we are looking at right now is the operations hub piece of DroneSense. You can see right now, I have three feeds here on our left-hand side flowing in from around the country. The drone that we are seeing centered of the map is York County's drone in Maine. If I snap over here, you can see we have another aircraft in the suburbs of Chicago. And then if I snap down to my location, we have another aircraft here in the northern suburbs of Atlanta. All three providing real-time telemetry, real-time data streams, to anybody that has access to our operations hub. But today's focus is situational awareness. So beyond what the drone is seeing, which that is a great tool, what else can, can we give our incident commanders, our ops personnel to provide better insight onto what the drones are seeing? And to me, the first piece of that is Esri integration. So let's think about, if we will, a traffic accident down here at the intersection of Old Peachtree Road and Buford Highway. With our Esri integration, you can see that I've ingested several different Esri layers. So we know what the drone is seeing. The drone is monitoring this accident, but what if we could get some insight on traffic conditions as well? So this layer I just turned on, what I'm gonna do is zoom out just a little bit so you can see it. This is the location of all of Georgia Department of Transportation's traffic cameras. But beyond this great kind of visual cue, I can click on any one of these cameras and get a snapshot in real time from that camera. Uh, this one's looking like it's taking a little bit longer to load. If I click down here towards downtown, you can see a real time snapshot from that camera. Now on the GDOT side of things in their private account, when they click into these camera views, they're getting a real-time live feed from that camera. So again, the drone is focusing on the accident scene, but now for additional situational awareness, we're also able to pull up and monitor traffic in the area as well. 
So not only are we seeing what the drone is seeing, we're monitoring traffic conditions. And let's think about this a different way. I'm gonna zoom out real quick and I'm gonna turn this layer off. And what I wanna do is snap out to Texas. Everybody knows oil and natural gas is king in Texas. And so let's think about a emergency response to a pipeline disruption or a pipeline hemorrhage in Texas. So this layer I'm gonna turn on now, this is the network of pipelines, both above and below ground that bisect the state of Texas. Hundreds of thousands of miles of pipeline. And let's say we're monitoring a fire incident in this, you know, in this area, we need to get some additional information out to our personnel. By utilizing this specific layer, I can click on this system. It's gonna tell me who the operator is, the system and subsystem name, as well as the diameter of the pipe, as well as the commodity that's moving through that pipe. So again, more information to provide better situational awareness and better insight into the type of response and potentially the type of resources that we might need uh, to mitigate this, this incident. Beyond the ESRI piece, we have another set of features and functions that I think are very important to touch on today, and that's our feature layers functionality. Everything that DroneSense does is mission-based. So if I zoom back down here again to my aircraft location here in the northern suburbs of Atlanta, uh, what I want to talk through now is utilizing some of the feature layers. So it's great that we can see what the drone is seeing. It's great that we have that, that real-time telemetry flowing in, again, regardless of where we are anywhere in the world. How can we give additional information to our pilots? How can we assign them you know, additional tasks to do with the drone? And by utilizing some of the feature layers, I think that's the best way. So if I come into our feature layers tool, at the mission layer, here we have this first net ops mission. I have the ability to come in and access hundreds, almost thousands of individual icons and symbology from the National Wildland Coordinating Group's 936 symbology and a company called Iron Sights, which is all public safety standardized symbology. And I can take and say, I know that this road here is blocked. I can add this blocked road and as I am dropping these symbols here in Ops Hub, over here on the pilot interface, if I zoom down in, you can see where I've dropped this no access marker. But let's think about this from the pilot's perspective. Maybe we're flying a search and we come across our victim. How are we going to notify our non-drone personnel, our boots on the ground, our command staff of that victim if they don't have you know, if, if they don't have this kind of insight, they're not a part of the drone team. What if we could take and drop a marker on the map that's going to show where exactly our victim is? And if I jump back here to the operation side of things, you can see exactly where we drop that victim marker. We can pull some information from this like GPS coordinates to help navigate our boots on the ground into where this person was found. Again, utilizing this uh, this symbology in a, in a valuable way. You can see here there are literally thousands of symbols from USAR to access hazards and pre-planning and this all flows back and forth between our mobile application as well as the operations side of things. Now in Mark's area you know this uh, this third feed we see over here I believe is from the scene where he uh, that video was showing the last fire if we were to snap up to Mark's location, we on the operations side can go in and start providing some additional information. So what if we have multiple aircraft in the area and we wanna kind of give them assignments on where to fly? I can come in and draw a polygon here on the map. I can apply this as operations boundary for pilot one or whatever the case may be save that and now on the mobile application side mark can see that operations boundary and know that hey this is probably the area that i should be operating within so he could then fly to that area drop a flight plan do a mapping mission whatever the case may be based on some information that we're providing from the mobile app or from the operations side of things and he could also even as he's flying along 
have the ability to start dropping pins and markers, just like we saw from my mobile application view. So there's a lot of back and forth that happens between the operation side of things and the mobile application side of things beyond just seeing the live stream. But what's great about this, let's say we're going on an operation where you know, we're the only drone sense user in the area, but this is a large scale, you know, an MCI and we need multiple personnel to be able to see this from outside of our drone sense organization. I'm going to assume because this is a heavily technology based webinar that most, if not all of you have a cell phone in your pocket. If you were to pull that cell phone out right now and scan this QR code, which I'll leave up here on the screen for just a moment. If you scan that QR code and follow the link that it takes you to, you're going to have the option to open up all three of these live streams that you see here on the map without having to have any sort of credentials into my DroneSense account. So we can share this even beyond DroneSense. But for our agencies that are, that are utilizing DroneSense that may be coming to assist us, we can take this mission code that you see here just above the QR code, provide it to them, and they are able to ingest this mission into their specific DroneSense account to where now we have drones from two, three, four, five, six separate agencies flying in their own respective accounts but all streaming into one location. I'm gonna close out this QR code because I'm gonna assume now that all of you are hardly listening and checking out these live streams on the map. Uh, but as you can see here, if I come back into my drones and device list, right now I have one, two, three, four, five, six active devices around the country that are flowing in to one place. And again, this can all be accessed whether you're on a desktop, a laptop, an Android phone, an iPhone. I think the most unique place I've ever seen our platform opened up was in a Tesla. And you can see the, the same number of feeds here that you guys have access to simply by clicking through on your phone. I'm gonna column these out just so we get a better idea of what all we have available, but no limit to the amount of streams, no limit to the amount of viewers, and there's no limit to how many people we can share this information with. All of the Esri information that we looked at is completely private to your individual account. And where we live is on the Amazon Web Servers Gov Cloud. So it's incredibly secure, encrypted both ways, and you will not find a better solution to provide you enhanced situational awareness and sub-second live stream latency than our platform. But the biggest thing, and to tie this in with FirstNet, everything that we do is dependent on either a Wi-Fi, LTE, or a SATCOM connection. After a big disaster, what's one of the first things to go down? And that's the network. But by partnering with programs like FirstNet, who have the ability to bring in cows and pigs instantly to a disaster area and put a network up, we can quickly start utilizing this drone data to do damage assessments, to, to look for victims, whatever the case may be. And we're really only relying on a small portion of the network bandwidth. For the smaller drones out there, such as your Mavic size aircraft, we need a connection of about one megabit per second up and down. For larger aircraft like your Matrice that are carrying multiple payloads, three to five megabits per second is gonna allow you to get that live feed out to anywhere in the world. It's gonna be actionable, it's gonna be decision quality, and we can only do that because of programs and solutions like FirstNet. Uh, I hope you have found our platform to be valuable. There's a ton more that we offer on the fleet management side of things, but I think that this is where the value lies in today's discussion, showing the situational awareness, showing how we can share this information out across multiple customers, across multiple agencies, and pull it all into one place. Uh, and so with that, I will kick it back to Kevin. Good deal, it was great to see the inside uh or just the video outside of your yard and Mike's yard and just seeing how that all streaming together. And in a lot of ways, when I think of FirstNet, it's, it's a sort of force that's operating and working in the background when you don't even know it's there. Ideally, everything is just a lot of continuing to do and, and move on as if it was, as it's supposed to. Um, and a lot of what you said with the, the cows and the pigs that can be deployed, that's what those devices leveraging FirstNet allow you to do. Um, so I, I now want to bring in, um, Travis and Therese uh, to now kind of give a, Travis, if you want to kind of give your perspective in terms of the FirstNet roadmap, 
Um, I, uh, should I pull up the, the slides, Travis? Yeah, go ahead and pull them up. It's perfect. Right. Thanks, Kevin. <clears throat> um, all right, I will turn my video off and okay. yours will be on and just tell me, <clears throat> tell me where to... Go ahead and start that slide seven, I think it is, um, with Teresa and I, and we'll kind of go from there. Perfect. Thanks, Kevin. Um, thanks again for joining along. And it's hard to follow a, a live demo like that, especially when I'm going to start talking about roadmap type stuff. But it's also important. Um, <clears throat> again, with the FirstNet Authority and the work we're doing with a kind of private partner, private public partnership, as Jeff mentioned, we're, we're thinking about a lot of these things of, of UAS technologies. Um, you know, UAS are really a great example of a tool that were once considered only for hobbyists, but really is now changing how agencies are able to execute their day-to-day -day operations or kind of becoming a force multiplier, getting that bird's eye view as we saw in the fire video and in some of the damage assessment. And we understand these new technologies in the space may not necessarily come from public safety vendors. And, and the first and authority teams are regularly thinking and reaching out to these technology vendors and incubators across the country in order to identify these new solutions that could really make a, a difference for public safety today. So as we kind of take a step back and think about the first net authority, what we're thinking about is may have lost Travis there for a second. Teresa, are you, are you still there? I am here, yes. Looks like I got dropped. How much did I lose? Uh, probably the last 10 seconds. Maybe you start over from that last train of thought. Okay. Um, so again, what's what's the role of the authority in the unmanned, unmanned aircraft systems? Um, and as a note, I live out here in the sticks. Most of the time the internet's good, but it's usually a, a game of will the internet drop or will the dog bark? So fortunately we hit that one. So my apologies. Okay. Role of FirstNet regarding unmanned systems, right? First and foremost, we're an advocate for public safety's needs for UAS data over the National Public Safety Broadband Network. We know, as has been discussed today, it's that connection, um, as I just demonstrated as I'm on my local cable company, that, that real-time data and transmission is most important, especially in these critical scenarios as they're sharing that UAS data. Need to understand and influence the public safety requirements and standards, such as NFPA, 3GPP, and ANSI, especially as they pertain to UAS and as they're influencing some of the utilization and designs of these systems. And one of the best things we can do, and one of my favorite things to do, is really engage with state, local, tribal, and federal agencies on how UAS are used today. So Kevin, actually jump to the next slide. Sorry, I must have gotten missed when I uh, popped in and out. So kind of the bulleted list of what we're up to. And then, of course, researching key technologies such as sensors, network tools, and data dissemination options, right? As we've seen today, the different sensors are really what's important in the field of getting that information out. Um, things that have been standard in the field of RGB sensors, um, <clears throat> things like infrared, but now LIDAR is starting to come along as we start thinking of ortho mosaics and all that other really data heavy things that are very important as we start to do accident reconstruction and things like that. How do we push that data across the network is very important to us. And of course, now we really need to work with public safety agencies to understand the security impl implications of unmanned systems, right? Security is becoming first and foremost as we start to think about how that data is being utilized and transferred either within an agency or across different agencies. And then as we kind of look a little further along of counter UAS, how might FirstNet play a role in some of these counter UAS operations in, in large events and even small and rural communities? So go on to the next slide, if you would, Kevin. So this is kind of a breakdown of how I've been thinking about the utilization of FirstNet in the field today. And it was actually kind of a good demonstration of it you know, as it was today. As FirstNet kind of being that core right there in the center to be able to provide that data connectivity. Really, if we start thinking about from sensor to display, the UAV sensor is really only a value of those who get the information they need to, right? We can take fuel, we can take battery and turn it into noise, and we can fly around all day long, and we have lots of fun doing it. But in the end, it's really that sensor that's on the, the UAS that is of most importance of how those operations are being done and what the information is being provided. And if those bits don't get where we want them to be, then that really flight doesn't really meet its optimal potential and really provide the information to those people who need it. 
Public safety is increasingly taking advantage of the cost savings and effectiveness of these small unmanned aircraft systems and augment their situational awareness, as which was brought up today, during these incident or daily operations. As such, the criticality of this data disseminated by UAS requires the broadband network that is dedicated to public safety and its mission. And as been mentioned with FirstNet, we've dedicated priority and preemption so we can get that data out to the people who really need it in these mission critical scenarios and environments. During larger events, sorry, during small operations, this data may only be consumed by the drone operator, visual observer, and somebody right next to them. And it may be just living inside that small ecosystem. But if we start thinking about the larger events and the potential consumers of UAV data has been kind of shown today and people who are scanning the QR codes, we really need to think about how important it is to get that data and information from the person who's doing the flight out to the people on the far side, your incident command, emergency systems, asset tracking, field teams, how are they gonna use this operational picture that's built out by them and actually affect their operations and make these critical decisions? And go ahead and go to the next slide for me, Kevin. And one thing we think about too is a little bit kind of a, using kind of manned aircraft term, but it applies here is really that cockpit air resource management, right? Pilot's got enough going on keeping that aircraft in the air, but he's also got to balance the information coming from the UAV, any information that might be coming from ATC, his visual observer, and then other oper oper opportunities and operations that are going on around him. Again, the information that he's providing from that sensor on the drone and providing it downstream to those consumers is critically important, but they've got to relay information to them of, wait, okay, maybe you need to go to the B side, maybe go over here to go look for Timmy in the woods, right? There's information that the pilot's consuming as well that helps affect those operations. So we think about that too in the first net side because that data connectivity and that voice communication is critical for how they're going to operate in the field today. So we kind of shift a little bit on the next slide to think really about our roadmap. You want to slide the next slide for me, Kevin? So as we kind of step back and think about the first net authority as well, um, Jeff Bratcher had mentioned about the public-private partnership between the first net authority and AT&T first net. And part of what we have to think about doing from the first net authority side is how would we start thinking about these reinvestments into the network? And the way we've done that from the roadmap group is really breaking down into these six key technology areas. Two of them I'll do a brief focus on today. Right, the core is kind of what I call the heart of the network. It's really where the switching and connectivity systems that are really connecting things together. Coverage is the thing that people will think of all the time, right? It's the big towers. It's the footprint that you live inside to share that information. The situational awareness domain is really gonna be the one we hit today. And we think about how the aggregation of data comes together as was shown in earlier videos from the drone, connectivity of the video that came from some of the street cameras. How do we bring all that together? Voice communications is really start thinking about those voice and mission critical communications and some of that mission critical data and voice video that come along with it. Secure information exchange is really how do we make sure that we have a streamlined and critical connection that is secure and easy for the operator to use but still provides that level of security and that they need to operate in the field today. And the last domain that I'm responsible for is the user experience domain. And it's really about how the responders interact and touch with the FirstNet network and really those interfaces along with that. Going ahead to slide 12, if you would, real quick. So this is really a quick overview of the situational awareness domain. And at the heart of it is really kind of that common operational picture that we've kind of talked about today and how that information from, in this case, the drone, help paints that, paints that picture for the operators in the field and how it influences their decision. The overall domain really refers to the ability to aggregate and synthesize information in real time across those multiple sources, be it human, machine, sensors from the field, and really drive those and present actionable insights to public safety in the field today. And I thought it was a great indication of how drone sense in this example had video from the drone laid over the map, and then also was able to show the video cameras and other things from the air so you get the full picture. And even in Mark's demonstration of as the teams were going in, you get the view of the whole facility, you can look at the top of the building. Again, prevent, provides that entire picture of how things are working. As Jeff had mentioned, one of the main things we've been doing within this domain is really thinking about the location of personnel. Um, most agencies have AVL and they can locate their vehicles rather quickly. But as soon as the responder steps away from the vehicle, do we know where that responder is located? 
And then to make it even more exciting and interesting, now we're providing a Z-axis element into it. So as they go up into buildings, we have an idea of the height above train, where that responder's at, and we can aggregate that with some mapping information to know where they are within, within that facility. So some pretty exciting things going on there. And then next one with the user experience domain, you go to the next slide for me. There you go, perfect. Um, again, this is where we're thinking about where the user interacts and touches the network. Um, I've been working on this domain since we've kind of laid them out the last few years. And really thinking in, in this realm, we're very focused on mission capable devices and mission enabling applications, because we know that these devices and ability to connect with the network is really where the user interfaces with it. That device in your hand is really, again, where we're seeing where in, in the case of the, the controller for the drone, the iPad where they're getting information downstream, or maybe the responder in the field with their phone in hand. This is really where your interaction goes. And we really want to think about how that enabling technology allows you to stay focused on the primary mission. With that, I'll hand it over to Ms. Therese Manley from PSCR, one of my favorite people working in the drone space and how they're kind of doing some leaning forward and looking at these technologies with some of the challenges. Thank you, Travis, um, for being one of your favorite people. Thank you. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, I work for NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, and PSCR is in the uh, Communications Technologies Lab, which is one of six labs um, in this federal organization. And we focus solely on advancing public safety communications technologies. We do that by working with stakeholders, uh, individuals such as yourself, many of the people that are on this call today whether you're a first responder or you're working in industry or academics to help and support public safety, we work with all entities. Uh, you know, Travis talked a lot about uh, what FirstNet is doing in the current space and um, pre-production or commercialization. And uh, PSCR and NIST is kind of a, we're, we're sister organizations or agencies and we work very closely together on the side of PSCR, we really focus on the research, on the future aspects. And uh, we look at what, what are first responders doing today in their day-to-day -day operation, and how can we improve that from a communication standpoint. Uh, next slide, please. So um, just to touch on the key areas, they match up pretty closely to what Travis just talked about with FirstNet. And, um, and that's because those are the strongest areas for us to help with technology. Um, the mission critical voice uh, and LMR and LTE interoperability, that whole area, we're just, we're, we're looking at ways to pour, push to talk services over to LMR and making those more reliable. Um, in the location-based services area, GPS, making that more accurate on the indoor, uh, a little bit about that X, Y, Z access and helping with tracking and navigation. Um, and then user interface and user experience, same, same situation, same message as Travis, really. We're looking at different user interfaces. Uh, we're even looking in, into some of the future aspects of uh, heads up displays and using some of the virtual reality and augmented reality that might be able to help uh, first responders in the future. And then data analytics, you know, there's just a flood of data. There's large data sets that need to be dealt with. We need to make them more secure and we need to be able to analyze them so first responders can react in a timely manner and save lives. And then um, a couple of the cross-cutting areas that we look at really cross-cutting because they cover all those different aspects of our portfolio are cybersecurity and network resilience. Um, I'll, I'll talk in a minute about network resilience, which really uh, is the area for our uh, drones, but cybersecurity is, uh, covers all those different areas and um, is, is implemented in every aspect of what we're looking at. Um, I'll talk a little bit about resilient systems on the next slide, if you will. So, um, you know, we, we focus in my main focus, I work in open innovation, I work on the UAS program that helps support and is supported by open innovation. 
And, but there's a, the, the very big focus of our need is public safety. And what are their goals? And the, the, the drones are flying today. They're the eyeballs that are reaching areas similar to what Mark mentioned and all the people on this call today. But where can we take that a little bit further? And I'll, and I'll mention that on the next slide. But we also look at the partnerships um, the partnerships that we bring in to help us uh, engage in improving some of this research and then hopefully bringing that to product and commercialization. Um, and then, you know, we're also looking at industry standards. One of the divisions of NIST in our engineering labs works specifically on robotics. So not only flying robotics, such as a drone, but also ground robots and water robots. So, you know, we look at those standards and best practices and how that affects public safety and the need. And then prize challenges is probably, it can be a new area for some of those of you on the call. It's one of the areas that we use to solve our research problems. And we do it by crowdsourcing. We reach, we reach solvers from around the world to help us solve some of these very unique problems. And that's one of the ways that we have, uh, we're successful at PSCR, but also in our UAS program. And I'll talk a little bit about that on my next slide. So um, we have a current challenge going on and I'll talk a little bit about how that supports first responders. But I also wanna touch on the past couple of UAS prize competitions that we've had held. They were mainly focused on um, a uh, part 107 under 55 pound drone carrying a device. That device was simulated, simulated to be a network communications device. So we've talked about how can we improve network communications for first responders. Well, the drone carrying uh, a 10 pound weight, um, what is the current uh, analysis of what a network, a small network uh, communications network could provide and give two, three mile coverage for first responders on the ground. Um, so we did some research in that area to try and push solvers to um, fly a drone for the longest time possible so that we could give communications to those first responders on the ground for the long longest time possible. Um, the success of that is moving us forward into research and also hope, hopefully helping with industry. So, Back to the current challenge that we are running right now, it's called the First Responder UAS Triple Challenge. And it's about speed, resilience, and security. And I'll touch a little bit about what their focus areas are because if you are, um, you know, just to, to bring you all up to speed, if there is anybody who is interested in, in supporting or joining the challenge, there is an opportunity in the April timeframe for you to come and um, participate and hopefully have some, some winning uh, solution. In our 3.1 challenge, we're looking at uh, optimizing a UAS so that we might be able to improve search and rescue. And in that scenario, we're really looking at a heavy, heavily forested area. How might a drone flying within the FAA Part 107 parameters be able to fly and um, uh, locate uh, a lost person, a first responder on the ground? And how can they do that quickly? and with speed and with efficiency. And then in the 3.2 challenge, we're looking at how might we be able to relay files or data or information to first responders on the ground and um, being able to do that in a very quick manner, but also being able to do it uh, where in the future, maybe it's a video, maybe it's a firefighting scenario where uh, it, uh, firefighters are trying to, or an incident commander is trying to get the latest images of how a fire has progressed to individuals on the ground uh, within a two, three mile radius. And then the third challenge is kind of a unique area for us. I did talk about cybersecurity. However, security, um, the security focus for this particular challenge is only on navigation and control. We're starting small and we will um, advance, but we're looking at how we might be able to attack and provide a countermeasure to um, a drone that a first responder may be flying and limiting um, a hacker or a limiting 
uh, individuals from uh, bad actors from taking control of uh, one of our first responder drones. So that's kind of, those are some of the other areas. We, we look at first responder requirements, VTOL, um, uh, um, visual line of sight as well, uh, loiter. We're looking at all these different aspects that first responders need, even to the point of making sure that the entire system has a weight limit so that at, at maximum two individuals can carry that, um, uh, that box with, that contains the UAS because we keep all of these requirements in mind. So that's how we run some of our challenges, but certainly from a uh, PSCR perspective, we are, we are continually improving and focusing to um, uh, find areas as technology improves. So again, I, I encourage you to join the challenge if you would, and I'll hand it back over to Kevin. Thank you. Appreciate that, Therese and, uh, and Travis. Uh, Therese, if people are interested, should they just visit usstriplechallenge.com? Yes, uh, thanks, Kevin. Great. That is the best location to find all of the rules for the contest and um, all the information about challenges, uh, the UAS Triple Challenge. They can also visit PSCR Open Innovation to locate other types of competitions that we run. Fantastic, thank you. Um, well, I think, Kevin, you're gonna kick off the round table here. Before you do that, if you don't mind, I have a couple questions here from the audience. Uh, one from Laura, and I think this is for, for Travis and if Jeff Ratcher, if you're still on. Um, how do deployables, she's speaking of FirstNet deployables, enable fixed wing drones throughout wildfire scenarios, throughout wildland fire scenarios? So I think that's a couple of ways I think you could do it, right? Right now, I don't know, depending on, I'm trying to not, I'm gonna make some assumptions on where Laura went with this one because right now we're kind of thinking fixed wing drones. Today, right now it's, you're not doing command and control, particularly a fixed wing because the, the delays and stuff like that. And it really hasn't been built out yet for a fixed wing scenario. So I'm gonna kind of lean downstream more right as you're getting the data down to the controller. Um, and now we're starting to think about deployables and you're getting the data then either from the phone controller that you're then connecting to the deployable and then pushing that information out. So it'd be fixed string, rotary wing, you know, quad copter, whatever the heck it is, that would be kind of a similar scenario. As long as you've got the hand controller, it has that LTE connection, first net, tying itself then to the deployable and getting that data out. And as mentioned kind of before, right, deployables, um, depending on its backhaul, you could be going through a satellite, you could be going through a fiber. So teams have to be cognizant in those scenarios of how they're taking advantage of that backhaul and making sure they're doing it the most efficient way possible as they're pushing that data out. Thank Laura, if I didn't you. quite tackle that like you wanted, Thank please. You, um, question from do you? Uh, question from Eric: Are there plans to allow agencies to fly FirstNet 4G LTE cell on wings on their agency-owned drones? I'll kind of tackle that one because <laughs> that's that's a challenge, right? Um, I think right now with the advent of the compact rapid deployables that are now on FirstNet um, that allow agencies to own their own kind of deployable system. And it's small, goes back to the, the trailer hitch onto a car. Um, it's worth looking into. The only reason I bring that up is because it allows people that are FirstNet users to deploy their own um, deployable with connectivity to the network. So it's starting to see how they're allowing these first responders the ability to then kind of deploy their solutions in the field. As we start thinking of a cell on wings, much more challenges come along the way because now we're getting that node up in the air and we have to start thinking about the potential impacts of the network as you're flying you know, up to 400 feet, whatever ceiling you're going to, right? Somewhere between zero to 400 and the ability to provide that bubble over LTE. So it, it creates much more of a, a challenge to the network and we're going to kind of have to really think through that and, and some of the associated use cases there. I think it's a really neat one, especially as we start to think about we're, we're in the in the wild looking for Timmy, wild and fire, something like that. The ability to kick things up there and provide that connectivity is actually very advantageous. 
and it is something that we're we're thinking about, especially in the PSR PSCR realm. Um, Therese kind of mentioned the challenge of getting a 10 pound payload up in the air. It's something that they're starting to think about is how we provide that connectivity via a drone, untethered being the scenario that was the challenge and creating that connectivity in the air. So it's something we're starting to think through both from the drone point of view, but also to think about the network. So is it something that's gonna be happening? Uh, near term, it's something we're still thinking about. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't start bidding on it any time in the near term because there's so many technical challenges along the way, but it's something that's very interesting to think about. Great, thanks Travis. Thanks, Travis, for that context. And Kyle, I think you dropped off there. But so now I want to um, to bring more of our uh, speakers back on stage. And, and Kirk, Kirk, if you want to pull your um, video back on. And, and Kirk, would you, you're having such extensive experience as a first responder uh, and now very involved in all things technology and, and innovation in the fire service. Um, I'd, I'd love an initial kind of hot take from you uh, on sort of like your thoughts on drone usage uh as well as kind of leveraging the lte broadband and, and kind of what you saw from the demo to where we are today to where we're going um and then, then we'll turn into sort of open round but open round table but but kirk could you what's your kind of point of view on on everything that you've seen so far today well first off gratitude to uh everybody right the the uh, uh the drone sense team and travis and Therese and jeff for helping build the network that it can connect to and it's just so critical as we look to move from the c2 legacy command and control two-way voice model into what's next and and my my experience relatively modest 30 years maybe 10,000 calls in a big city organization uh members maybe will run 100,000 calls in a fire department and i just spoke to someone in a, a big city department who they run tens of thousands of fires a year and thousands of calls a day. And they said, look, when my captain gets on the fire flow, they said they want two things, water and information. And this, this is allowing that information, the situational awareness that's so critical. And the, the airborne uh, asset is one facet of what I like to consider a smart community risk reduction and life safety did digital solution set. It's suites of solutions on the way to what the DOD might term as a C5 ISR model instead of C2, where it's command control, cyber communications, uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. There's so much that needs to come together. And thank you all for building the platform. My opportunities to be on NIST challenges successfully a few times in the past and what a great opportunity. So any first responders, please go this website look for the the open challenges uh including a z-axis challenge that's open right now with indiana university being run the frst challenge because we can bring together mesh networks iot machine learning ai computer vision one of the things that the team was showing earlier that i'm just thinking okay we have rbg cameras what about object recognition with computer vision um it, it, there's just so much to be done and now there's almost 3 million connected devices, excellent. Well, there's 325 million souls in the US of which we lose more than 7,000 a day before COVID. This is gonna bring that opportunity together uh, to make us a smarter um, first response community, save some of those lives, empower those, especially the dismounted uh, first responders to be able to do good work and always uh, grateful to be on the call with you, Kevin, and, and thanks for asking my perspective. Of course. Thanks, Kirk. Well, so now I, I if Jeff and Mark um, and really everyone else, all the other speakers um, just kind of wanted to to use the next 10 to 15 ish minutes or so. And this was initially planned for 75 minutes. Um, maybe we'll go 80. And of course, anyone you can you can leave. Also know that this is going to be recorded, but wanted to kind of use this as a chance to allow anyone else in the audience to ask questions. I've had a couple of different um, direct message, direct messages as far as questions. Um, but I think uh, if, if uh, this is kind of a question maybe for, for Travis and Josh and Kirk and just sort of in general, um, is this concept around mobile broadband in general, is, is how, how is it adding this additional layer of near real-time sexual awareness to agencies? And I think it's my, my take on this is how is what we're talking about now different than what it was 10 years ago? And, and why is this 
so significant in regards to what the extra value it brings to to first responders. So there was kind of a lot of words in there, um, but but Travis or, or Josh or Kirk um, would love your your hot take on that. Uh, I'm I'm going to go real quickly. So imagine all the participants and all the panels on a conference call with now a conference call now, no video, nothing else, just two way voice. How effective are we going to be painting a picture with words? The difference is it's an emergency. So it, it gives us just so much more. And I want to hear the other's statement on that. Yeah. I mean, I think 10 years ago, even five years ago, we didn't have the level of latency that we do now. So the, the data wasn't necessarily actionable or decision quality. Now we're showing fire chiefs, incident commanders, what they need to see in real time, allowing them to make decisions. And especially now as programs like DFR drones as a first responder come into play, we're already seeing the future play out. Uh, so I think that's the biggest difference in, in my perspective. I'll take it from my search and rescue point of view, right? Um, 10 years ago, I would step out of my car, grab a paper map, put it in a Ziploc bag so it doesn't melt and, and go off and operate with my dog. Now, I still have my paper map. It's still soggy and I still have my, you know, my compass as a backup, but open up my phone. Now I've got my map, I'm using my tools there. And now even better, cool, if there's a drone in the air, I can potentially get drone video as my dog and I are working. So I know exactly the area that I'm going into. Maybe they're gonna find Timmy in the woods before I can even get my dog set because that drone can cover so much area. It's providing so much more data and the ability for people to become more efficient in the field um, so that one, we're responding faster, we're safer and we're getting people home. Yeah, Josh. Know, our biggest commodity in, in public safety. So the more time we can save to potentially save more lives, I, I think that's huge. So that, that time concept partly is into this next question of, of how not only the data is created, but how it is then distributed and consumed. It seems like we do live in a world of data overload and, and we sometimes are in the, the, the situation where maybe tech and data is actually creating more headaches and creating more challenges for first responders. And, you know, just think about this, this brain between our ears, you know, we can only process so much. So uh, talk to me about that time aspect. How is it by leveraging FirstNet and tools like DroneSense? How are we taking data and turning them into actionable insights that are, is ultimately going to save time? So for us on the drone sense side, it's been working closely with first responders to figure out what data they need to see. What is the information that is valuable to a fire chief, to an incident commander, to a police chief, and just showing them that drones are capable of doing a lot of different things well outside of public safety, as we all know. And from our perspective, we just want to kind of put the, the focus just on public safety to not have that information overload, to give them just the tools that they need, because again, time being our biggest commodity, the more time we can save, the more potential we have to save lives. Kirk, do you want to take a stab at that? And then uh, I, absolutely, I was, oh, yeah, I'm open. I was just gonna say, I, I, got, I was able to see our friends uh, working on computer vision from San Francisco yesterday. Um, amazing, what if we simply could see in the dark as firefighters? But I wanna recommend Augmented World Expo to everyone. There's uh, I think there were almost 400 speakers. And what the, 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 if, if a picture can paint it, it is worth a thousand words and time is of, is of the essence. It's been said, I think a number of studies, if we could save them in our response times across the US, it'd be 10,000 lives a year. We, we ingest data so quickly visually. There are gonna be challenges. We saw it on the webinar today. Absolutely, we need the paper map and the two-way voice fallback but that should absolutely be a fallback. And so some of these colleagues uh, that are, are working on so, so many different things that have some have already been public private partnerships with the NIST team and the first net lab. I, I'm, I'm privileged to, to know that for a fact, and it's going to be, it's being built by enterprise. You might've, you might've seen the news recently. We live in a three-dimensional world and it is becoming more and more digitized all the time and it's just going to be right in front of our eye building information modeling uh all the different assets and digital terrain maps in the wildland so much if anybody wants uh, more geek stuff just fire me a personal message I'll, I'll i'll send you some uh some of the other stuff that's being done by adjacent teams and uh what good work the nist and first net are doing thank you for empowering 
the community. Soon it's going to be like a dream within a dream. I don't even know which, which reality is real. Uh, but Therese, did you, uh, as I you turn your camera, I'd love your hot take on, on the question I had earlier. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think because data analytics and doing those computations on a drone in the sky versus being able to stream that data down to a server, um, you know, those are some of the things that we're looking at. And it's a really important question because there are sensors, there's cameras, there are, uh, if we're going to add more network devices onto the drone, how do we get that information down to the ground quickly? Or how, how can the drone analyze that and get the information to a first responder in a timely manner? So that's really kind of the answer, you know, what we're trying to manage from a drone perspective. But I'll also just add from a PSCR perspective, we are looking at data analytics and the security of the PII or the personally identifiable information in live streaming, real time data. Um, the flood of data information is, is, is key to our future. And I think that we all need to continue to look at. Travis, you, you know, want to paint some light on that too? Yeah, actually, I want to give more props to PSCR. Um, Scott Ledgerwood and his user experience team are doing a lot of research in cognitive loading um, with first responders and the amount of data that's coming to them and how it's getting consumed and how it might come differently to responders to make them more effective, more efficient. So keep a pulse one on that one. PSCR is doing some really good work in that realm. Absolutely. And, and to Teresa's point, the edge fog cloud compute capabilities, it, it's, it's all evolving, uh, I would say, faster than I and my colleagues and partners are, uh, and maybe faster than the industry as a, as a whole, that, that enterprise is doing it, regardless of public safety. Um, and there's going to be challenges. And to me, we're explorers. If we consider this the, the fourth industrial revolution or the first data revolution, we can call it what, what we want. But thank you for all being explorers in this brand new space. Uh, no one's done this before. So I've got maybe one of our final questions here of for agencies that maybe have been reluctant to um, to explore drones or to to leverage LTE more than just maybe calling and texting. Um, you know, and, and the part of what we wanted to accomplish here today is, is showcase that art of the possible. Um, but how do we like all of us on the most people on this call today? I think have a, a, a general understanding, and hopefully, I'll learn some more about drones and LTE and FirstNet and, and all the capabilities, but what what would you say to some of those uh, maybe naysayers, you could say, um, and, and to kind of get them to consider moving forward? And, and, and what, what are some of the steps to consider um, better leveraging and better using technology like this LTE drone says type technology? Um, again, kind of a fully loaded question, a lot of, a lot of ways to work to go, but um, Jeff, I see your, your video is back on. Um, not sure if you want to take a first stab at that uh, or Josh, um, or Jeff, you want to take a first stab sure, at that? Sure, Kevin. Yep. Thanks. Sorry. I had to step away for a sec. The boss called. So you got to answer that phone call. That's right? important. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Um, I would add to what Kevin's asking, because again, as we look to evolving the first net network, we're now ask, actually looking at 5G as well. What does 5G mean for drone response? What does that bring? Uh, I know it's still a little early, but are there additional capabilities that 5G is going to enable in the drone um, use? I would add to what Kevin asked. Thank you, Kevin. For sure. Josh? Yeah, so, you know, I think we've pretty much gotten past at this point the toy mentality of, you know, the drones are just a toy. What is this going to do for me? And regardless of whether your agency has been flying drones for five years or for five days, we are all still on the bleeding edge of what this technology is going to accomplish in the future. And, you know, don't be scared to take the crawl, walk, run approach. You know, look at large agencies like FDNY who started with two guys and one drone in a vehicle covering all seven boroughs. There's, you, you don't have to go out and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on equipment to start, but you have to start somewhere. This is an incredible tool that can be a, applied across multiple disciplines in public safety. Um, I feel like if, if it's not something you're already looking at, it definitely should be somewhere you're starting to focus some of your time and potentially some of your future budget requests because this technology is not going anywhere and it's only going to continue to advance uh, in public safety. 
Good point, Josh. Kevin, I'm going to tag on to that. But before I retired, I'm grateful to Consumers Fire to allow some of what I was working on. I'll put a, a website here for folks to go look at what we call 911 Go. What if everyone had an application on their phone, right? We're talking about first responders. What if everyone had something on their phone that enabled their uh, exit pathways and the like? And most of that work, the vast majority of the work uh, with few prices from NIST, but it was private a public partnership where we reached out to uh, folks like uh, Kevin and the team at Darlene Smart Firefighting and, and asked for assistance because if not now, when? And while we are challenged with personnel budget, uh, budgets, bandwidth, technical expertise, all the rest of it, we're real clear two-way voice isn't really a solution in the modern era. And so many people came to the table and said, yeah, we'd like to be involved. A matter of fact, we've been trying to find a fire department or police department that will give us their opinion on what we think is a reasonable solution set. Travis? Yeah, I think too, um, when teams are thinking about drone solutions and some of these technologies, take a step back. Think about how it's gonna be enabling your other operations as well, right? We very much think about the guy with the controller, the drone up here, and we're providing a little bit of data to those people right there in the emitted ecosystem. Think about the entire agency of how that data, as it gets pushed out to every member of the group, how it's gonna change their perspective in both the response, but also time and cost savings overall, and overall implementation on how that's making your agency more effective. Because it becomes part of your overall operation instead of a niche group. You're going to combine that capability into your overall response operation, and it's going to make a difference for you. Well said. Make, makes good use of the budget, Travis. And there's a number of agencies, including in the DOD, that will work with public safety and do matching funds for organizations who are like, well, we have a little bit of money to spend on UAS. Uh, we need a little more. And uh, maybe Air Force uh, AFWorks would match some of those funds. And then to the local jurisdiction or the state or the federal entity that's funding it, it just it leverages the value of the, the monies that are spent. So we have uh, eclipsed the, I guess you could say 75, 80, 81 minute mark, uh, which, is, which is great. And, and a lot of these events may be trying to keep to 60 to 75 minutes, but um, wanted to now, uh, Kyle, before I round it out here, was there anything else you wanted to add to what, what was just said before we do final comments? No, no, no. I just wanted to thank Mark Brunel as well for um, for sharing his perspective and how they're doing things up in York County EMA and just thinking about what's the next step. How can we add, um, serve you? You know, that's, that's our job, especially in the field as advisors, is to meet your needs, uh, not now, but as the folks in the panel have been talking in the future. Don't hesitate to reach out. I really appreciate you being on. Appreciate all the panels. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, I think to echo Kyle's point is, uh, if you are interested in all things FirstNet, uh, reach out to Kyle. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of it's his it's his job to to help you, um, <laughs> as well as you know, for me from Smart Firefighting Darley, uh, I can I can be a conduit to help you. So, I, what I want to do here now, uh, just kind of like last uh, sort of sixty second or less. Final thoughts, comments, questions, challenges to the audience. Uh, everyone, everyone that you see here on the screen has given some different type of valuable insight about all things drones, LTE, FirstNet, drone sense. Um, but I want you all to give us a final mic drop here. Um, it could be one sentence. It could be 60 seconds. Um, but I would love for, um, you know, I'm just going to maybe kind of popcorn pick on someone. Uh, you know, Therese or Travis, kind of start with one of you two, if we could uh, just kind of a final thought, challenge, idea to the audience, um, 60 seconds or less. less. Um, Therese? Sure. Well, I, I was just um, thankful for being part of this uh, presentation, but I really would encourage anyone on the call, any agency to just take that first step. Um, buy the drone if you haven't used it. Experiment with different aspects and uh, get in touch with NIST, PSCR, or FirstNet to see if you might be able to help us and we will help you. Thank you. Thanks, Therese. Travis? Yeah, again, thanks for having us on and everybody who attended, thanks for being here. Um, Want to reiterate the FirstNet roadmap that we're part of and as we're looking at how to do these future investments and reinvestments in the network, 
the voice of public safety is key in how we're making these decisions. So we would ask that you reach out to us through Kyle, myself, personnet.gov, come, come have the conversation with us because your voice is how we're gonna direct these funds and make them more effective to make the National Public Safety Broadband Network effective for you. And we wanna make that the best value it can be via drones or other operations in your, in your community. Thanks again for the time. Thanks, Travis. I'll shoot over to Mike next. I appreciate the time, everybody that uh, stuck around. Uh, just a couple plugs. Make sure you visit uh, dronesense.com to get the latest from us. Uh, reach out to our team. Josh dropped his information. Uh, you could also reach out to sales at dronesense.com. Uh, and then just one other plug. Make sure you go to smartfirefighting.com. Uh, an incredible, incredible community for all things first response and technology. Uh, above that, you know, Kevin, just one other quick question. Hopefully the links and everything shared from Kirk here uh, will be shared out in the email following the Zoom link. But uh, if you're in the audience, make sure you check out some of those organizations. Good deal. Thanks, Mike. Uh, next, we'll go Josh, Kirk, I think Jeff. Yeah, so I, I just want to echo uh, what Therese said, and you know, don't be afraid to take that first step. We are all still on the bleeding edge of this technology. And beyond that, don't be afraid to reach out to neighboring agencies that have already taken that first step, because the only way we push this technology forward is by knowledge sharing. Uh, like Mike said, you can reach out to our team directly. Myself is Joshua at dronesense.com or sales at dronesense.com. We'd be happy to provide you with a deeper dive through the platform and some of our capabilities beyond the situational awareness. And then just a big thanks to FirstNet, uh, Captain Kirk, Kevin, Smart Firefighting, Darley, for, uh, for allowing us to be part of this today. We really appreciate it. It's a pleasure, man. Thanks for being here. Cheers, Kevin man. Kirk? Uh, thanks so much, Kevin. Uh, like I said, nice to be on a call with some of my mentors and look forward to be on your next VIP uh, webinar where it'll end up at smartfirefighting.com. What a great resource you've done. Thanks for the end of, to what you've done for the industry, Kevin, and everybody on the call. Thanks so much, Kirk. Appreciate that. And uh, Jeff? Give us uh, maybe some some words of wisdom, a final mic drop. I don't know about that, but uh, it's a great discussion. Thanks for setting this up. Thanks for having us to listen in. Again, um, I was taking notes here. It looks like Kirk, Mike, and Josh get the best wall award. Uh, I liked your walls behind you. So uh, I wrote that down. Uh, great discussion. Again, we're here to learn from public safety as they use these new technologies, what we can drive into this network to better support it. Um, drones and the situational awareness they bring. It, it's obvious to me as a technology geek, the impact this will have in saving lives. And we're, we're committed to working those into this network and making it better useful for that. I would, I would think about the situational aspects. How do you make action on what you're seeing? How can you drive that back to those that are having to make those decisions? And um, it's a fantastic area that, that I'm excited about. So thanks again, Kevin, for that. Thanks, Jeff. And Mark, I'm not sure if you're still there. You wanted to have any final comments? Um, I am. I am here. Oh. Thank you. I'm unable Great. to turn the uh, video back on. Okay, no worries. Uh, any any kind of final thoughts, comments from you? Yes. Uh, right around yes, I do. Yes, I do. Uh, but being last, I get the benefit of hearing everyone else. But I'll, I'm going to pin. I'm going to pin uh, some comments on a couple of things. First is absolutely get out there and meet with people who are using drones effectively. Also, take that first step but do it in a prudent way. Make sure that you have a, a, a clear expectation of what you want to do, what you want to receive, and how you want to capture the information to make it work for your agency. And that is the crux of the issue that we deal with, uh, trying to sell the drone technology to other agencies so that they have a clear understanding of what, what the benefits will be to them. Thank you, Mark, for that. And, and kind of final thoughts from me is you've all sat through this, uh, the recording as well. And I know you've taken at least one bit of knowledge from this uh, and you've, you've learned something uh, in regards to the technology or an application or reaching out. But my challenge to you is what are you going to do differently tomorrow? Uh, don't just, just kind of be passively watching this and just go on with your daily life as if nothing happened. You learned something here today and do a favor to me and, and take action, reach out to Kyle, reach out to Josh, reach out to Therese, reach out to Kirk. You know, there's so many people here that it is, they're, they get up in the morning to serve you. So use them, take advantage of them. And that is my asking challenge to all of you. 
Um, make sure to check out all the resources. We'll, we'll do a recap email. Um, as Mike said, smartfirefighting.com, the, the podcast where we're interviewing different uh, thought leaders around the industry and want to continue this conversation. Um, and last kind of special shout out and thanks to, to FirstNet and everything that you, you are doing for the industry. Really exciting to see it come to life. I uh, love talking about the art of the possible because it's just exciting to see it evolve. So kudos to the FirstNet team, uh, everyone at PSCR, NIST, Drone Sense, Darley, Smart Firefighting. Much love to you all. Have a great rest of your Wednesday. Stay safe and uh, stay in the loop and stay tuned for more content from us coming, coming up shortly. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone.